Is everybody ready? Okay, uh, I'm under Sheriff Pat Ivey, uh, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. I'm going to give an update in reference to an officer-involved shooting from uh, last night. Um, I will talk about some of the facts I talked about last night and then give you some new information. Um, <clears throat> last night, at about 845, officers working in an overtime capacity for our Violent Crime Reduction Initiative in the area of 32nd Street, West 32nd Street and Stewart, um, saw a vehicle speeding. The vehicle also spun its tires. That's what alerted the officers to the vehicle. It passed the officers. They then proceeded to initiate a traffic stop on West 32nd Street. The subject did not initially stop um, with the blue lights, marked police car, um, until the officer hit his air horn and the vehicle pulled over. We thought that he pulled over for the air horn, but reality was he had connections to the house that he stopped right next to. So he was actually, which happens a lot in police work, um, you have individuals, this wasn't a pursuit by any stretch, um, but he had ample opportunity to stop prior to when he did. Um, but on several occasions in police work, you actually have pursuits where individuals will just run until they get back to the house or to a friend's place. A lot of times that can be for a variety of reasons, but it can even be they don't want their vehicle towed. <laughs> so um, the subject, as I stated last night, immediately exited the vehicle. Um, verbal commands were given for the subject to re-enter the vehicle, but he did not. Um, that was given from limited information through an attorney yesterday from the subject officer. Um, there was a little uh, discrepancy, I think, in some of the media reporting yesterday a reference to primary, secondary officers. What I meant was first vehicle, each of the three police vehicles, two witnesses and subject officer, were all in their own individual vehicles. We were not riding two people deep um, because I saw that uh, somewhere. Um, the primary officer is the one that was initiating the traffic stop, the vehicle, police vehicle, immediately behind the subject vehicle. Um, so at that point when the subject did not comply and get back in his vehicle, this is where we're waiting on the officer's statement. Um, it's normal protocol where this can take a few days to a few weeks before we get a statement from a subject officer involved in an incident like this. Um, which is, as I even said yesterday, is just like any other significant criminal investigation case, which is what we are conducting. Um, we don't ever come out and report, hey, the suspect of this murder that we're investigating, he said this. It just doesn't happen. And sometimes I think the community would like for it to be a little different, but this is reality. It is a criminal investigation. So um, at that point during the traffic stop is where we don't have a lot of information. Um, and something occurred, which the officer then discharged his firearm, issued firearm twice, striking the suspect both times. Suspect uh, then received medical attention from that um, shooting officer. Then rescue was called. We interviewed several people last night to include two witness officers and some citizens that were in the close proximity of the incident. The vehicle was removed. The vehicle was sealed and removed and taken to a sterile location, which is normal protocol, because we also secured a search warrant because we do that because we want to have legal grounds to enter a vehicle or sometimes a residence and look in places and for what uh, we, uh, we, we may find to support our criminal case, which was the case last night. Um, we did secure a, like I said, a search warrant and in the search warrant, just inside the driver's door, on the driver's floorboard was located this bottom picture, firearm. So that firearm now, <clears throat> as normal protocol, is collected and it is submitted to FDLE, who independently of us in their own lab does uh, the um, forensics processing of that firearm. It was also reported in some various media outlets yesterday that FDLE had responded I don't know where that came from. I never said it. Uh, my initial statement from last night is pasted on our website. You can go back and watch the, it in its entirety, and it's not there. So I'm not, done, I'm not ready for questions. So um, which brings me to the subject officer. Subject officer, as I told you yesterday, is a nine-year veteran with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. His name is Serge Paul, P-A-U-L, common spelling. Spelled correctly. Serge, S-E-R-G-E. 
He is assigned to patrol zone six, which is the north side. But as I said earlier, he was working in an overtime capacity for the violent crime reduction initiative. Okay, and that's why he was in zone five, which is the area where the shooting was. The subject that he shot has been identified as 24-year-old Keith, common spelling, Crowder, or Crowder, C-R-O-W-D-E-R, -E date of birth 530-92. If you look at the other picture we've uh, brought over here, um, that uh, this is Mr. Crowder on his Facebook page. Uh, and if you notice in his right front pocket, and we're working through the process if we will ever be able to determine whether this and that gun are the same. The magazine is different, but that magazine is an extended magazine, which the gun was not originally designed to carry, um, but he has since added an extended magazine for the purposes of this picture. He is a certified gang member. He's a certified gang member of MCT, which is Moncrief Thugs. And he identifies himself on Facebook as Moncrief Snoop Hitman Jr. So uh, I will say this. The situation yesterday is very, very similar to an incident that happened in January in Clay County where he, he, he committed a traffic uh, infraction. Clay County uh, stopped him, and in the vehicle was located marijuana and a loaded handgun. He is currently out on bond for those charges, and I believe just as recent as the last three days, uh, those, they forensically, they got what they needed back on that original case, and he will be looking at those felony charges. His criminal history to this point includes various misdemeanors, but he is not a convicted felon. But now he will be dealing with the Clay County case, uh, which just recently forensically linked him to the weapon that was found during that incident in January. So maybe that was one of the reasons for his heightened alert or him wanting to exit the vehicle unknown at this time. Um, he still is in very serious life-threatening condition at the hospital. And uh, so, and the officer's been placed on administrative leave. I will add this. The officer, um, through um, the cold case homicide detectives, has been asked that he is not contacted by anybody not actively engaged in the investigation. It's a criminal investigation, and he has voiced that to us, and I wanted you guys to know that. And uh, with that, um, I will take a few questions. Um, Sheriff, do you know how fast uh, his car was traveling when, when he was initially stopped by the officer? No, no ma'am. And, and we will, when we get the, the statement from the officer and then go over the witness officer statements, we'll probably have a, a better indication of what that would be. Anybody can elaborate a little bit more on from the time that they initi initiated a traffic stop to the time that they actually s stopped the car. How much time had gone by? Was there any kind of chase at all? No, this was not a, a vehicle pursuit. Again, um, you know where Stewart is? Stewart and 32nd Street, right by the waste right off of Gulf Air right there. It's not a long distance, but he had ample opportunity. And the speed limit in that residential area is 30 miles per hour. Um, I think you could attest that if a police officer got behind you, put his lights on, you could probably stop within 100 feet. Well, he didn't stop in 100 feet. He continued, and chances are it was probably to get to the location of the house in which um, the incident occurred, like within 30 feet of that parcel. You said yesterday you guys were looking at a grassy area. Was there any evidence recovered from there? No, but you, but you always do that. So, we, what, so when homicide comes out, they have an inner perimeter, outer perimeter. The, the, the area immediate around the, the vehicle and that nature would be a hot zone, and they would process that. So... That vehicle, as you, if, you, if you could tell, I don't know if you could tell from y'all's vantage point from last night, he had actually pulled to the left side of the road where opposite eastbound traffic would be going. So when he pulled to the left, he was next to the beginning of the grassy lot. So we processed that. Brought in some extra illumination and attempted to look in that area. Would, would the officers have gun in the car? Or any uh, drugs or anything else? Yes, there was, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. Very similar to the January, uh, marijuana was also recovered in the vehicle. So the state attorney's office is working through um, their case to see about uh, any and what charges would be placed on the individual if indeed his, his uh, prognosis or if he gets better. Two questions. What, what? what kind of gun is this? And then could you go over the name of the gun? It looks like a semi-automatic handgun and the caliber and all that. I do not know. Okay. And then you said his name on Facebook was like Moncrief. Like Moncrief Snoop, Snoop Hitman Jr. Thank you. Uh, Sheriff, do you know how close the officer was to the subject when he 
I can tell you this, that his vehicle was probably 10 to 15 feet. I mean, rear bumper to front bumper approximately. So um, um, fairly close, not too far away. Yeah. About 10 to 15 feet then from the From spot. front bumper to rear bumper and then, you know, front, front, front left door, driver's door to the officer stepping out of his car, so. What did the witness officers say? Did they, could they offer anything about what was said or what happened? I have not, Dana, I have not been privileged to everything in the witness officer statement at this point. Will that, will that, have, can that come out earlier than the, than the officer involved? We can look at it. If it offers anything to more insight, then we can, we can offer, obviously try to address that. So you don't that know what, if or no. they saw or heard no. or. And you got to remember, regardless of their perspective, the officer's choice to use deadly force will have to stand on the merit of his statement, period. Well, if he had that one, and if that's the same as that one, and there was one in January, that means he, he if either he either rehab had that because this is not the same gun that's already seized in labs right. from January. So no, I couldn't I couldn't tell you, okay. but it's not in very good shape. Mr. Chair, you mentioned yesterday that there were some potentially civilian witnesses. Were were there civilian witnesses, and have you spoken to them? Yes, we have spoken with them. Um, actually, interviews were conducted uh, with homicide along with the state attorney. Um, I, I again said last night. Um, I guess trying to be a little bit more transparent, and no, you're not transparent. We've always tried to be, we want to explain these things where people actually have an understanding of how these things progress, um, how FDLE processes uh, the evidence, and how the state attorney office responds to the scene and is right there with homicide detectives step by step. So they don't, they don't just listen to what we say and we say, hey, guess what? He said he was here and he said he was here. They are right there step by step with taking in their own account of what they're hearing, of what where the evidence was. So um, that's that's just us trying to be a, a further explanation of how this transpired. Any, any surveillance video in the area that you know of? That, that's, that would be part of the canvas. I haven't been briefed on that part of it yet, but it would be normal protocol for us to go door to door, stores, everything in an area to look for the, potential evidence like of that nature. No matter Dana. the source, there was some um, question or concern about FDLE's involvement and their involvement in this hasn't changed from what you've always done in the past. They process evidence. Yes, they, do. they process evidence um, in all of these. Right. So independently of us, they process and come up with facts based on their processing of whatever evidence is submitted to them. Then that is then officially given back to us, and it's included in the case file. So in this, as in other counties uh, in Northeast Florida. That has not happened. 23, 23 agencies in the state of Florida, 23 out of 67, have MOUs with FDLE for them to come in and, and, and conduct police shooting investigations. That doesn't necessarily mean that all 23, this is sheriff's offices only, okay. not police department, sheriff's offices of the 67 counties. That doesn't mean that even the ones that have MOUs uh, utilize FDLE on every single police shooting either. So, but that's to give you true numbers that, that, I, was, that I am aware of. It's, if it's off one or two, some may have added to or, or may say we're not longer going to use FDLE because that happens also. The numbers are a little bit different out of, I think, the top uh, 25 larger police departments in the state. I think only seven have MOUs. So, a relatively... It, we do not have an MOU at this time. Yeah, so I was the homicide commander for three years, and I can tell you this. I think FDLE would back me on this. I think even federal agencies would, would back me on this. We have experts here that do this as well as anybody in the country. So, yes, we have the resources here. Also, if every agency in the state of Florida all of a sudden said, guess what, FDLE, come do our police shooting investigations, FDLE manpower resource wise probably could not do that lift right now it would be impossible that there that agency is not as large as you think even though they represent the entire state so for a variety of reasons i'm very very comfortable and i know the sheriff is very comfortable too in our ability to investigate these type of incidents with the assistance of 
the state attorney's office, the FDLE processing, and as, as recent in the other case, the FBI always reserves the right for them to come in and do a review. The Department of Justice can do that any time they want to or if we ask. Period. This came at a time when there was some, you know, when there's been requests from the community for, uh, for that kind of an investigation. And I mean, how do you respond to that? I mean, you explain that there, there, there are people who are coming in the SCLC and the APD other yeah. things are saying that they... I have conversations with SCLC. I talked to Ben Frazier last night. He's a spokesman. I also talked to Dr. Wilcox and Dr. Gray from that organization specifically. Um, we try to... Uh, I don't want to say educate because they're... they're smart people. Um, I think part of it lies in a true misunderstanding of how things are done and to the, to the level of proficiency that it is done. I've heard the fox guard in the hen house comment and things of that nature. To know that you're submitting evidence to FDLE and homicide and then your state attorney's office investigator is right there with them, for it to be for anything to not be just in layman's term on the up and up, mm -hmm. you better play the lottery because you're going to win. How can they be further engaged? Who? The, the community? And we're, we are working through that now. So I think, what's, I think we're going to ask various leaders, and we have offered before, as far back as John Rutherford being sheriff, trying to allow them spots into our Citizens Academy, offering for them to come in and have an explanation of our use of force policy and, and uh, officer-involved shootings, I mean, really one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we've also got some of the same questions when in regards to uh, internal investigations. We want to offer that up also uh, and be totally transparent. So we are pretty deep in some conversations. I can tell you specifically with the one group that you've, you've, you've named, SCLC, I've offered that up. Was that kind of loaded? Yes, it was. Yes. And Mr. Rector, you said that you... Um Three hours in. Three hours in. Sorry, three hours in. And could you explain a little bit more of that violent crime initiative, what that entails? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to tell you part of it because part of us, we're, we're still rolling out. So the overtime piece is actually, I don't want to say a stopgap, but it is something to assist us to deal with the violent crime that we're experiencing in the community right now until the sheriff's new violent crime initiative gets fully operational. To include, uh, you've heard about we're having impact teams, uh, which are members of the gang unit, homicide unit, narcotics unit, um, working together on a team instead of just homicide going out and just homicide detectives and later reaching out to narcotics or the gang unit. We're putting teams together that really have the resources to, to identify a problem, maybe a particular person or an area, and be able to deal with it right on that team and then respond to specific incidents um, involving individuals that are committing the violent acts. So I will say this, and the numbers will support me, there is a relatively small number of people committing a large number of the violent incidents in Jacksonville. Fact. Fact. And the sheriff's new violent, which he's going to talk about more, um, which he has secured the funding, will directly try to address that issue. And I won't comment any more than that, but the sheriff, you'll, you, you will be hearing a lot more. The violent crime impact teams are different than the overtime. Yes, they are. That's why I tried to say the overtime is just an opportunity for us to be in areas which we can show per crime mapping where we know that violent incidents occur. And the violent crime impact teams are stand, it's a standing team now. Yes, they are. Yes. We and that is that's part of that's that's part of the new initiative. Yes, sir. We talk a lot about transparency and Sheriff Williams has talked about body cameras. They're not in the twenty seventeen budget. When does that become a serious part of the discussion? It's, it's very serious. I can tell you this. Director Tony Davis, who is our Director of Services, has been in pretty, pretty lengthy discussion with two particular vendors um, in reference to us doing potentially a pilot program. Reality, let's go back several years with the tasers. This is no different than taser implementation. One's potentially a weapon. The other one captures images or... or, or uh, incidents. Um, the reality is to roll it out and be successful, we have to see what the impact would be. We have to develop a policy. We have to train people in that, and then we have to implement that agency-wide, and a pilot program is how we would do something like that. 
Um, I would think in discussions with the sheriff that uh, um, I know that we would like um, cameras to be a reality as soon as possible. The, the not asking for the funding in this budget cycle is, is part of the relationship that we're developing with a couple of those vendors. It looks like it may not be a significant financial ask for that pilot piece, which will paint us a better picture of really what we're dealing with. I will also say this, that we have already received uh, policies and procedures from other police departments. We're already this deep in it um, to see best practices of what they're already utilizing so we don't have to fully reinvent the wheel. So we're, we, are, we are a lot deeper than people say, but we're trying to do a better, better job now of letting you guys know this and hopefully let the community know. Commissioner, just so I'm clear, you said you're not asking for money this cycle because it's a relatively small amount. Yeah, see, see, and I think the sheriff has said this, and I'll say it publicly if you, if, if you haven't caught it. Part of the impact is this. Some of these manufacturers or companies that do the body cameras, they are almost willing to give you cameras or a large portion of the cameras. That's not the huge cost. The huge cost is the data collection. And until you really lock down in statute how long you have to retain the video, Imagine what that cost could be. So you enter into a contract with a company and they said, you know what, I'll give you a thousand cameras. But you know what, let's just say two million dollars first year for video storage. Then all of a sudden you find out you got to store it for five years and you need 500 more that you got to pay for. So you're going to 1500 cameras and you find out the next year that they only commit to a one year contract. Then they say, guess what, it'll be seven million dollars on year number two. That is massive. We do not want to be blindsided. We do not want to start up a program and then all of a sudden say, sorry, community, we know this was a good thing, but now we have to back out a little bit. We do not want to do that. And, I, and I'm a firm believer, and the sheriff has said this, that body cameras are going to catch a lot of good police work. What's going to happen for us is this. It is going to catch officers doing things wrong, and I'm good with that. I'm the undersheriff. If, if, the, if, it, if, it, if it requires significant discipline up to termination, guess what? That's my job. It will be dealt with. But if it shows that what the allegation of the, the, the citizen is making is incorrect, it's good for us, too, because it shows an officer following policy. So it's, it is, there is no holdback from the administration on wanting body cameras for any reason. So, and I will tell you this taking the discipline and some of the guys sitting in the room are uh, working internal affairs. Um, the reality is this, been under sheriff since July 1st, 2015. We have arrested nine employees since then, nine. We have terminated 16 on paper, but outside there's another three, four, five that resigned because they knew they were gonna get terminated so they technically don't get called terminated. <clears throat> and that is because their, their behavior was such for administrative maybe reasons they were being terminated, not just a criminal violation, so they didn't need to be arrested. That should show, and we haven't done a real good job there, because you don't really want to advertise that you have to do that kind of stuff, but that's reality to be transparent with the community to say, we hold people accountable. Usually when I say those stats, they go, oh, I had no idea. Yeah, I know you arrested a few, but I had no idea it was that much and how many people got terminated. That's, that's reality that we would hold up to including an officer that uses deadly force and he wasn't justified, we would hold him accountable and do what was necessary, period. So I'll take one more, if y'all even got one. How soon could we see cameras on the streets, whether it's a pilot program or otherwise? Well, you put me on the spot. <laughs> um, June, I would hope by sometime latest, early, middle 2017, and I know that's a little ways away, a year, but to engage multiple companies and really hammer down the details, and hey, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it, city government moves about as slow as a tortoise. Um, reality, I'll, I'll, I'll stand on that, okay? All right? I appreciate y'all.